The Little Prince, Chapter 7 On the fifth day, thanks again to the sheep, another secret of the little prince's life was revealed to me. Abruptly, with no preamble, he asked me as if it were the fruit of a problem long pondered in silence. If a sheep eats bushes, does it eat flowers, too? A sheep eats whatever it finds. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes, even flowers that have thorns. Then, what good are thorns? I didn't know. At that moment, I was very busy trying to unscrew a bolt that was jammed in my engine. I was quite worried, for my plane crash was beginning to seem extremely serious, and the lack of drinking water made me fear the worst. What good are thorns? The little prince never let go of a question once he had asked it. I was annoyed by my jammed bolt, and I answered without thinking. Thorns are no good for anything. They're just the flower's way of being mean. Oh. But, after a silence, he lashed out at me with a sort of bitterness. I don't believe you. Flowers are weak. They're naive. They reassure themselves whatever way they can. They believe their thorns make them frightening. I made no answer. At that moment, I was thinking... If this bolt stays jammed, I'll knock it off with the hammer. Again, the little prince disturbed my reflections. Then you think flowers... No, not at all. I don't think anything. I just said whatever came into my head. I'm busy here with something serious. He stared at me, astounded. Something serious? He saw me holding my hammer, my fingers black with grease, bending over an object he regarded as very ugly. You talk like the grown-ups. That made me a little ashamed, but he added mercilessly, You confuse everything. You've got it all mixed up. He was really very annoyed. He tossed his golden curls in the wind. I know a planet inhabited by a red-faced gentleman. He's never smelled a flower. He's never looked at a star. He's never loved anyone. He's never done anything except add up numbers. And all day long he says over and over, just like you, I'm a serious man, I'm a serious man. And that puffs him up with pride, but he's not a man at all. He's a mushroom. He's a what? A mushroom. The little prince was now quite pale with rage. For millions of years, flowers have been producing thorns. For millions of years, sheep have been eating them all the same. And it's not serious trying to understand why flowers go to such trouble to produce thorns that are good for nothing. It's not important, the war between the sheep and the flowers. It's no more serious and more important than the numbers that fat red gentleman is adding up. Suppose I happen to know a unique flower, one that exists nowhere in the world except on my planet, one that a little sheep can wipe out in a single bite one morning, just like that, without even realizing what he's doing. That isn't important. His face turned red now, and he went on. If someone loves a flower of which just one example exists among all the millions and millions of stars, that's enough to make him happy when he looks at the stars. He tells himself, my flower's up there somewhere. But if the sheep eats the flower, then for him it's as if, suddenly, all the stars went out. And that isn't important? He couldn't say another word. All of a sudden, he burst out sobbing. Night had fallen.
I dropped my tools. What did I care about my hammer, about my bolt, about thirst and death? There was, on one star, on one planet, on mine, the earth, a little prince to be consoled. I took him in my arms, I rocked him, I told him, the flower you love is not in danger. I'll draw you a mother for your sheep, I'll draw you a fence for your flower. I didn't know what to say. How clumsy I felt. I didn't know how to reach him, where to find him. It's so mysterious, the land of tears. Chapter 8 I soon learned to know that flower better. On the little prince's planet, there had always been very simple flowers decorated with a single row of petals, so that they took up no room at all and got in no one's way. They would appear one morning in the grass, and would fade by nightfall. But this one had grown from a seed brought from who knows where, and the little prince had kept a close watch over a sprout that was not like any of the others. It might have been a new kind of baobab, but the sprout soon stopped growing and began to show signs of blossoming. The little prince, who had watched the development of an enormous bud, realized that some sort of miraculous apparition would emerge from it. But the flower continued her beauty preparations in the shelter of her green chamber, selecting her colors with the greatest care and dressing quite deliberately adjusting her petals one by one. She had no desire to emerge all rumpled like the poppies. She wished to appear only in the full radiance of her beauty. Oh yes, she was quite vain, and her mysterious adornment had lasted days and days. And then one morning, precisely at sunrise, she showed herself and after having labored so painstakingly, she yawned and said, Ah, I'm hardly awake. Forgive me, I'm still all untidy. But the little prince couldn't contain his admiration. How lovely you are! Aren't I? the flower answered sweetly, and I was born the same time as the sun. The little prince realized that she wasn't any too modest, but she was so dazzling. I believe it is breakfast time, she had soon added. Would you be so kind as to tend to me? And the little prince, utterly abashed, having gone to look for a watering can, served the flower. She had soon begun tormenting him with her rather touchy vanity. One day, for instance, alluding to her four thorns, she remarked to the little prince, I'm ready for tigers with all their claws. There are no tigers on my planet, the little prince had objected, and besides, tigers don't eat weeds. I am not a weed, the flower sweetly replied. Forgive me. I am not at all afraid of tigers, but I have a horror of drafts. You wouldn't happen to have a screen. A horror of drafts? That's not a good sign for a plant, the little prince had observed. How complicated this flower is. After dark, you will put me under glass. How cold it is where you live. Quite uncomfortable. Where I come from but she suddenly broke off. She had come here as a seed. She couldn't have known anything of other worlds. Humiliated at having let herself be caught on the verge of so naive a lie, she coughed two or three times in order to put the little prince in the wrong. That scream? I was going to look for one, but you were speaking to me. 
Then she made herself cough again in order to inflict a twinge of remorse on him all the same. So the little prince, despite all the good will of his love, had soon come to mistrust her. He had taken seriously certain inconsequential remarks and had grown very unhappy. I shouldn't have listened to her, he confided to me one day. You must never listen to flowers. You must look at them and smell them. Mine perfumed my planet, but I didn't know how to enjoy that. The business about the tiger claws, instead of annoying me, ought to have moved me. And he confided further. In those days, I didn't understand anything. I should have judged her according to her actions, not her words. She perfumed my planet and lit up my life. I should never have run away. I ought to have realized the tenderness underlying her silly pretensions. Flowers are so contradictory, but I was too young to know how to love her. <laughs>